yeah, let's get started talking about Gutenberg. Um, my name is Brian DeConnick, and some of you may have met me in past WB Campus events. I don't actually work in higher ed anymore, so I am just here for fun to crash your party. So my main goal for this as moderator is to let these uh, very smart and talented people um, steal the show and talk about the cool things that they're doing. So I'm going to start by asking each of you to introduce yourselves and just give a very short summary of what your Gutenberg journey has looked like. And uh, you can interpret you and Gutenberg and journey in whatever way you want, because uh, those can all mean different things. So looking at my screen, I'm going to go just around uh, clockwise, starting with Travis. Hi, I'm Travis Cook. I'm a web developer at the University of Missouri. Um, my journey with Gutenberg kind of started whenever 5.0 came out and Gutenberg was kind of officially rolled out and it was messy. Um, I didn't really enjoy it. And I was, you know, I wasn't really sure kind of how it was going to look, you know, as a more finished product. It seemed very beta to me. And, you know, I think Gutenberg has come a long way since that time. Um, Whenever Gutenberg, you know, whenever they had, WordPress had announced that uh, Classic Editor was going to lose official support, originally at the end of this year, moved to next year now, um, that got me to revisit Gutenberg and how I use it and what I'm doing and how the University of Missouri can use it on our sites. And so that got me to look at how can I use the core blocks, how are Content editor is going to use that on our sites, as well as how can we tap into that and use our design system and use uh, custom blocks and you know allow that as a way for content editors to be able to interact with those blocks and those components. You know, I I had gone the same route that you know others had tried with the ACF Pro blocks, which you know are very functional. They work great, but the way of, that you use them is in my opinion was kind of weird and not as clean as what i would like so that drove me down the path of learning react and seeing you know how can i use these with you know our components and things like that so that's a very short brief this is my journey kind of thing so all right thank you and now uh next going around the circle is uh amy would you like to introduce yourself and tell us about your journey Sure. Um, so I'm Amy Grace Wells, and I am a senior content designer now at 10up, but I spent uh, probably more than a decade in higher ed um, and in including coming to other WP campus uh, events. And so I've worked a lot in WordPress over the years, and I know that I, I, I was also on the I, I don't like Gutenberg at first because I, I don't think the author experience was really great. And so um, I'm excited to be on this panel and come at it from a little bit more of like a content strategy and a UX perspective. Um, because my first experience of it was when I was working as editor at UX Booth and our it just didn't play with our theme well. And it actually made the content entry process like four times as long. It was horrible. and. And I am somebody who always loves to kill WYSIWYGs. I love structured content. Um, and so I didn't know how that was gonna work together. But since I joined 10 Up two years ago, you know, we really lean heavily into the block editor and I've been working with it almost exclusively for that whole two years now. And now I'm seeing the power of it. I'm seeing they've made some updates. They have focused a little bit more on author experience. And that's a lot of what I focus on too now is making sure that we have blocks and that we have settings on those blocks that are really available to all editors across the spectrum of um, experience. And I'm just being able to see more and more opportunities for how it can, number one, help structure content, number two, help with governance as far as like block patterns and taking advantage of some of those more advanced features. Um, so I've actually kind of come to be like, I, I, I kind of love it now, which is weird because I really hated it at first. Um, so it's been an interesting journey for me to go from kind of that one extreme to the other. So I'm excited to talk more about it. All right, and the last one in our circle is uh, Jesse. 
Uh, my name is Jesse Janowak. I am a developer at New City, which is a digital agency that specializes in higher education and large nonprofits. Uh, we started looking at Gutenberg before it before WordPress five when it was in plugin phase, and uh, to reiterate what everybody has said already, didn't like the editor ex the e editing experience at all, uh, the developer experience at all, uh, but. From the beginning, I was very enthusiastic about the author experience for the people making the sites. Uh, we were using uh, a an ACF block based approach for almost all of our client sites, uh, and it was really useful. But it was difficult sometimes to train and communicate the client uh, to the client about how to envision what the page was going to look at like based on the content that they had entered. Uh, so I thought that Gutenberg would be a solution to that. Uh, the short the short version is it took us uh, a couple more years before uh, Gutenberg was stable enough and had enough tools to not only let us do what we needed to do, but to turn off the things that we didn't want people to be able to do. It's not even a hundred percent there yet, but we're, we're doing what we can. <laughs> and, um, and I really like a lot of things about it. Oh, and we're all in on ACF blocks at the moment for, uh, for block authoring. All right. So I think all three of you mentioned things that I want to talk a lot about, but I'm going to start with, um, uh, I guess a question for Amy and I'll sort of give you a hint of where I want you to go with this as you talked about block patterns. Um, was there like an aha moment that you had where you realized like this thing that I hate is actually going to solve a problem for me? And can you talk a little bit about what that problem is and, and why you had that moment? What, what went into that? You know, I can't think of a specific moment. Um, you know, at any given time, I'm working with about four clients uh, and, and again, really focusing in on the Gutenberg experience and how we can use that to better present content. So both both kind of a combination of core and custom blocks. Um, but I think what happened really was kind of it, it was a slow aha. It was. I, I wanted to create custom post types. I wanted to create, you know, structured content. I wanted all this stuff to be dynamic, but that, you know, that doesn't work for everybody. And it doesn't always work as well when you're leaning on blocks rather than post types. There's still a space for post types and it's really important. Um, but we had, we had a big focus on kind of focusing on blocks and how could we define solutions through blocks. And it just kind of, I started to see it over and over and over again, where I could still create that structured content and I could still produce and, and create blocks that allowed for some dynamic content to be pulled in. And it just, what, you know, what just happened was I could see people starting to learn how to lay out content better than they could in a WYSIWYG um, in the classic editor. And it was something where, you know, so people still struggle with it. I do lots of trainings for, for organizations now um, and teaching them how to use blocks. But it was just something where slowly I started to see that editors could actually use this and in a lot of ways, sometimes better than trying to add images and trying to do add those kind of visual elements to content through the classic editor. And I think that's really kind of where I was like, oh, okay, maybe this isn't as hard as it seemed at first. And as your sort of follow up with that, and uh, Travis or Jesse, please feel free to share thoughts as well. What were some of the oh no moments, especially early on, um, when you realized like this is going to cause a lot more work or um, maybe not be worth the investment that it feels like now has been worthwhile? That was a very strangely phrased sentence, but I hope you got what I was going for. Um, I'll just kick off real quick. I, I think that I think that there is always going to be a bit of a need, um, and I apologize. Apparently, the mailman's here. <laughs> uh, there's always going to be a need to create some custom blocks. I think. I think every organization is going to have some unique needs that don't necessarily fit into core. So you do need somebody 
on your team who can um, help you with that, whether that's in-house or out of house. Um, so I think that that is a big transition, especially for a lot of higher ed organizations right now that um, haven't been using Gutenberg. It's gonna take a little bit of a lift and it takes a little bit of a training curve too to get people to learn how to use the block editor. And those are a couple big like, oh no, this is gonna take a little more effort than we thought. Mm -hmm. Travis, I see you nodding along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, at Mizzou, we're still kind of in the early stages of uh, rolling out Block Editor on our sites. We only have maybe like 10 to 15 sites that are actually using Block Editor at the moment. Um, so like the biggest like, oh no portion really isn't so much on the technical side. Yeah, like, yeah, it, it is a lot of work to create the custom blocks, especially if you want to go the React route of doing so. But the, the thing that really is the holdup for us is how are we going to train our content folks on how to utilize this new editor? Because, you know, especially, you know, for larger institutions, you know, rolling out something that is this big of a change as you're going from classic editor to block editor, you know, it's a huge shift. And so making sure that folks know how to use it and, you know, are doing the things the way that we want them to do and actually being able to also restrict the way that they're doing it. So, you know, we, there's things you don't want some folks doing on higher ed sites. And so making sure that there is a way to restrict that and trying to stay ahead of that curve so that, you know, you're not going to start seeing things in your site. You're like, oh, no, I, I didn't see them, you know, the ability of them to be able to do that. And so trying to stay ahead. Of that. And I think um, to that training point it, there, it, it is it is really scary to move from the classic editor to the block editor. Like it's, there's just something inherently intimidating about it. And I think when you come at it from that training perspective, you have to acknowledge that um, with your, your content creators and your editors, because it, it is a learning curve. It's not a big learning curve is in my experience, it's not as big as it actually seems, but it is really intimidating and you have to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for my part, the, there were two onos. Oh uh, one was technical, uh, and it uh, doesn't require a lot of explanation. It was mostly that I had a really hard time getting my style sheets, which are global usually, not not component based, to work in the back end editor and the front end, and all of the uh, block styles that were built into core that I had to override <laughs> um, and come up with really clever solutions, and then like half the time find out, no, there was actually a more elegant way of solving that that didn't require hitting it with a sledgehammer. Uh, but the other one that that's maybe more uh, applicable to entire teams is, is that we have, uh, we have lots of roles, like we have role based people on our teams. So we have our UX designer and we have our content, uh, de designer content, uh, specialist. That's the word we use. Uh, and we have our, our graphic designer and we all work together the whole time, but, um, uh, our designers had developed over the years, a, uh, a set of sort of design patterns based around the strengths and weaknesses of the tools we were already using. And it took some, uh, practice to break some of the old habits and and also learn the limitations of Gutenberg. Uh, all these things are like, well, that used to be pretty easy, but it's hard now. But that used to be super hard, but now it's really easy. Uh, the conversations got flipped on their heads a lot of the time, and uh, and conversations we we had gotten past, like they didn't have to ask me anymore if the, if it would work. Uh, we're suddenly turning into, oh, I better check and see if that still works. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And yeah, that's the way the way our our personal aesthetic, the way our work patterns, the way everything is influenced by the tools that we're using. And now we're dropping in a whole new tool that has a whole new set of constraints and set of capabilities. That's that's really interesting. But um, even then, yeah, um, go ahead. yeah, so even then, like, I know at, on our team, we're having on our kind of a design team, we're having one of our front engineers come in this week to talk to us about kind of what's new with Gutenberg. So it's even an ongoing thing where 
you know, you just, it, it's, it's to me, I love that because there's something always new to learn. But if you really just like your comfort space and you don't like things to change, it can be hard because there's, it's still a growing tool. And, you know, so we're even still having our front end engineers come in to talk about what, what patterns they're seeing and what things they're doing now so that we can, our design team can stay up with some of that and try and curb some of that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's uh, okay. It's yeah, not go uncommon. ahead. Sorry, yeah. you're talking over people. Sorry, it's not uncommon to have, uh, like, especially our, our content specialists say we'd like to present this content, but that's hard in WordPress, right? I'll be like, oh, it was on the last site we built, but that was six weeks ago. <laughs> um, this time, I'm now that I'm, I'm starting now, which means I have access to these tools that didn't exist then. Very, very much the same thing. All right. So Amy, you mentioned um, users who are sort of in that customs or rather that comfort zone um, and being hesitant to uh, step out of that. We do have a question from the audience. Um, Natasha asks, how do you respond if someone would rather use a visual builder like Divi or Elementor versus learning to use the block editor? Uh, does anyone have any experience with that? They want to speak to that. I'll just start by saying um, this is a place where block patterns or reusable blocks can be a really, really strong tool for those people um, because there are there are tools being built and 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 being at they're still rather new, but I feel like they've already gotten an iteration at least in them um, that really function just like a lot of those visual builders in a way. Like you can create a block pattern that you can drop into any page and it's it's kind of the same thing. Um, and so I honestly, I never really worked with any of the Divi or Elementor or any of those page builders. Um, so I don't have experience with those, but I do know that the block editor provides some of that functionality already. And again, I think the biggest thing there is the intimidation factor or a little bit of that fear factor. And I think kind of addressing some of that with these content editors that are really comfortable in that space and walking them through how to do that in the new space with the tools that are available, not just the blocks, but again, block patterns and reusable blocks will really help with a lot of that. Travis or Jesse, do you have any Divi or Bust users? Uh, I We have... Um some Elementor users. And interestingly, our own website uh, that we are working on for New City will be built in Elementor, uh, but most of our client sites are not. Uh, and it's, it's two different conversations depending on whether they have already been using it and want to continue using it, or they've just heard good things about it and want to know why they would choose Gutenberg over the other. Uh, the the First question is is very difficult and, and really varies per client, um, but my my case for using Gutenberg usually uh, revolves around uh, the support from the WordPress core team and community uh, that that using a more closed system like Elementor or Divi uh, won't necessarily have. Uh, but if somebody is like wondering if they should even use it, my my statement is pretty much always: if you go with Elementor, you're not getting a WordPress site; you're getting an Elementor site built on WordPress. If you go with Divi, you're not getting a WordPress site; you're getting a Divi site built on WordPress. They have entirely separate documentation, entirely separate workflows, ways of doing things, and they're not bad, but um, number one, I'm not qualified to give a lot of support for them because it's an entirely different thing. And number two, they're, if they're going to be trying to figure out how to do things, then some things are going to be done with WordPress tools and they're going to have to consult this documentation and other things are going to be using the page builder tools and they'll have to look over here. And if they're not savvy uh, with technology, tool, uh, web tools, um, they're going to be uncomfortable with that, but that's also often why they want to use it because they don't want to have to deal with code. So, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much where I come down on that one. Yeah. For me at, at Azu, we try to 
limit the amount of plugins that we're installing on sites to keep them running really as lean as possible. And so, you know, we we have a standard build with you know a standard set of plugins that we'll install, and then we'll run our theme on top of that. And so we want to keep it as close as to what you would get just installing WordPress out of the box. That way, you know, you can go search WordPress tutorials and you're going to find something very similar to how our sites are set up. Yeah, we're going to have some restrictions, but it's going to be fairly similar enough to get you rolling. Um, and so, you know, another thing, you know, for people that are, you know, against the idea of using Gutenberg or Block Editor is, you know, We've still been dealing with folks that are, you know, had experience with Gutenberg when it first rolled out with all the issues. And so internally, what we have done is, okay, we don't call it Gutenberg. We call it block editor. That's that's what it's called when it uh, has rolled out officially. So we did kind of like this internal rebrand so that we can kind of distance ourselves from, you know, kind of the mess that was Gutenberg when it first rolled out. And so that's kind of how we've approached it. And we've noticed that since we've done that, we've had folks that have, you know had a little bit more open mind about using it. So mm -hmm. no, that's that's really interesting. Um, I guess it is worth maybe level setting a little bit for people who are watching who might not know. Gutenberg is the name of the project of blockifying all things WordPress, I guess. But the block editor is the block editor as opposed to the classic editor. And that is, I guess, a, a nuance that is useful and also confusing at the same time, depending on the context in which you're using it. Um, I guess, so there are a couple of questions that are being submitted via Slido. Um, please, please, audience, continue doing that. I, uh, I have not forgotten about you. But I do think, um, you know, both Jesse talking about things being supported by WordPress core. And then Travis talking about that sort of rollout for Gutenberg and, um, you know, how things are named in the WordPress sphere of naming things. Um, this sort of leads to, I think a really important question to me, which is as more of WordPress blockifies, you know, we see, um, sidebar widgets becoming blocks. We see, um, you know, full site editing and the way themes working, changing over time. Um, what are some of the biggest open challenges and, and what are some of the biggest opportunities, especially in higher ed? This is to anybody. Nobody's eager. Okay. <laughs> That's it's, it's a challenging question because it asks us to read a crystal ball a little bit. Um, you know, I still go back to, I think ultimately with the right support and the right training, the biggest opportunity with the block editor is to create some consistency, which I think is one of the biggest problems in higher ed. And I've worked in higher ed since it was everybody go off and do their own thing to seeing it start to re-centralize to like, you know, there's been a lot of phases in higher ed right, uh, since I've been in it. And I think one of the biggest things is in a more centralized environment, it can provide some consistency as far as content, look and feel, things like that, but still provide the individual units their own flexibility to show off their personality if they are a more visual storyteller or if, you know, whatever that type of storytelling that they're doing um, with the good support, the good training, it, it helps create that consistency while also providing a little bit of that flexibility that individual units want. Yeah, that's all really good stuff. Um, I, for our part, we, we build a lot of new sites. <laughs> and so that's, that's what happens at an agency. We support the old sites, but we're not usually like turning an old site into a new one. So whatever we decide to code it with, the, we know what's in it. Uh, what's, what's dangerous <laughs> is that, um, I, I always tell people Gutenberg and yes, sometimes I call it the block editor, <laughs> but uh, a lot of times I use Gutenberg cause that's what you Google to get information about it. Still, uh, I say Gutenberg wasn't built for us. Uh, that is not who WordPress was thinking about, not who automatic were thinking about when they came up with Gutenberg, they were thinking of 
uh, I imagine it as like a one or two person team building a site all by themselves. And wouldn't it be great if they didn't have to write any code? Um, but for those of us who need to uh, lock things down, uh, maintain design systems and brand guidelines and whatnot, uh, it can be really challenging and it's gotten better, but then they keep releasing new things that are making it worse, like full site editing. And I, I totally respect what they're doing with it, but I have to turn it off. Like I have to not enable that because it doesn't do me a lick of good to expose all of those things to my client editors. So I, I, I'm laughing at myself because I ended my talk earlier today with the line, it's only going to get better from here, but I'm realizing that's a filthy lie because it's going to get better. I do trust that, but it's going to get worse first because if you look at their roadmap, what they're focusing on is that like single editor experience. Uh, and until they're kind of happy with where that is, I don't think they're going to spend a lot of effort on our needs as institutional website builders. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that last point. You know, it was it was all fine and good when it was just block editor. But now when there's discussions of full site editing, it's like, okay, so how are we going to be able to lock that down? Because, you know, we that's the first, you know, whenever new technology is coming up, okay, how are we going to restrict it? How are we going to keep people from abusing it? And so that's that's the part where I keep thinking about, you know, in the future, okay, so how is this actually going to look? Is it still going to be a viable option for Mizzou? You know, are we going to have to look into a different content management system? Um, I think it's also important to, to know, you know, depending on how far down the block editor Gutenberg rabbit hole you want to go, you know, as far as whether you want to do ACF blocks or if you want to do actual like, you know, native React blocks, it's going to raise you know, the skill level that's required to do development on site. So that minimum bar that you have for a WordPress dev is going up, you know, because, you know, there's a lot that goes into these custom blocks as, you know, we've heard folks talk about today in other sessions, you know, there's just, it's more than just knowing, okay, well, this is my component. You have to know about like, okay, these are the different components that are tied into the block editor. These are different components with the block library and so knowing how all those pieces work together it it's a very big rabbit hole which for me i i find it very exciting i i love it i you know i i can't wait to dig more into it but you know it's a lot of work so so travis as you are digging into it and just thinking about i guess the pace at which change has come to WordPress. Um, and just as a little side tangent, I think it was about five years ago, I was at a WordCamp and in my presentation, I uh, I said something along the lines of, and this Gutenberg thing is coming soon, but it's so far down the roadmap. Like, you know, it took forever to get the REST API. We don't need to worry about it anytime soon. And here we are <laughs> multiple years into the block editor. So when you think about the pace at which things have changed and you know you say you're excited about that challenge what do you do to keep up with it and what do you do for yourself to develop with the product that you're working with i mean honestly some of it is just kind of playing whack-a-mole it's like okay this is broken now and so i gotta figure out i go through the the repos and just say okay these are the things that are different i review change log like jesse had mentioned you know in his talk earlier which you know going through change logs and seeing what's changing, what's deprecating and trying to stay out ahead of it. You know, it's, it's tough because yeah, it's, it's very rapid the way the rate that they're going, which is exciting because obviously they're excited about it. And so, you know, I'm trying to get some level of excitement to match, but, you know, just trying to stay out in front of it. The part that concerns me the most is still, okay, how am I going to be able to restrict something? If it, something rolls out that, our content people just aren't ready for at this time, or you know, we haven't had the proper time to be able to vet it to make sure that oh, this isn't going to be something very bad for our sites. And so that's that's the part that you know kind of gives me the biggest headache. But you know, as far as the capabilities, the things that you could do with it, I think it's very exciting. You know, and so I'm just trying to stay positive about it. So 
Yeah, I, I I kind of envy you, Travis. Um, there are many things that I like about working at an agency, but one of the things that I don't get to do as much as follow the same site over a period of time and improve it, upgrade it with the latest tools. Uh, and that there is some satisfaction that does come from that, that, that I miss from, I used to work in, in a, a college as a web developer and incremental improvements. What is something that, uh, WordPress definitely gives us the opportunity to do <laughs> because like you said, they're changing it all the time. So I'd like to shift gears just for a moment and pick on a few more questions from the audience because I've been ignoring them for a little bit. Um, so first I want to start with um, a question that I think is very important and we haven't touched on at all um, from Adam Lentz about uh, accessibility. Um, whether the block editor will ever meet sort of WCAG uh, standards. And I guess for this group, when you're talking with your clients or when you're talking with people at your institution, how do you have that accessibility conversation around the block editor? What, what are the things that you say are good? What are the things that you say are bad? How do you frame it for your users? Nobody's eager to answer this question either. <laughs> yeah. It take it depends on the team and what their needs are, because we're unfortunately as developers using a tool not made by us in the unfortunate situation of having to say, if it's broken, it's, it's just broken. <laughs> so like, I would not want to, to build a Gutenberg site without a mouse. For example, if that were a limitation that I had to work under or uh, with a screen reader, uh, I don't know what the specific shortcomings are, but I do know that there are some, it's gotten a lot better. They've, they've put a lot more attention into it than they did at first. Uh, but it's, uh, it can only be as much of a priority as I'm able to do something about it. <laughs> And I'll just say from, from my end, um, a lot more of our accessibility conversations happen at the engineering side of things. Um, but I know that, you know, we are, we're building sites that are double a, like that's our standard, um, for everything we do. And again, we almost work exclusively in the block editor. Um, I had not thought about the author experience though, and the accessibility of that. So that is a really good point. Um, but I know, you know, when I'm thinking about design and, and accessibility that way, again, being able to have a support team from the dev and the engineering side that can help me customize blocks, either do custom blocks or small changes to core blocks, just to so I can make slightly more inclusive or accessible experiences um, is a really key thing. So kind of having that that really close relationship between design and, and development has been really important uh, for our teams. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to address accessibility with a product that you don't manage. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's a lot easier for when you're developing custom blocks of your own to try to really be thoughtful with how you're developing those, how you're using the components so that, you know, it's, keyboard friendly that, you know, that you're trying to tick all the necessary boxes, but, you know, with these core blocks and, you know, things that really it's on WordPress's core team, it's, it's hard to really be able to say, okay, I'm going to address that because it's like, well, I really, I can't, you know, I can submit an issue to WordPress and, you know, cross my fingers and hope that they'll see it and hope that they'll address it. But beyond that, you know, you know, I'm not ignoring the issue. It's just, I don't have the ability, you know, not due to technical ability, but due to I don't manage the product, you know, I can't address that. But I want to make sure that, you know, the things that I can control, they are addressing accessibility. So all of our components that we're developing, you know, all of our templates that we're developing, all of those things are being assessed for accessibility so that, you know, when a user goes to the site, it is accessible. And so if there's 
things that we can address, they're going to get addressed right away. Yeah, lest anybody think I'm downplaying accessibility, uh, I, I read the correct question directly from the thread, uh, and so I was addressing the back end, the editor. Uh, but yeah, it's it's completely possible to build a website with the block editor where the entire front end it meets all of the standards that you want it to meet. You're still in, in control of the code that gets delivered to the browser. Right. Yeah, and I, I think. Well, I don't know if you can hear the cat in the background. Um, that's exciting. Um, so yeah, I, I think these are all very good points. And and yeah, there is this distinction between what we can control and what we present to our public facing users and the components that we build for ourselves within the editor and then the bigger editing experience. Um, so very briefly, I'll just plug a couple of years ago, WP Campus sponsored the Gutenberg Accessibility Audit. Um, it's maybe a little bit out of date, but there's still a lot of really good information in there and everybody should go check it out in the learning library. Go do that. We put a lot of work into that. Um, I'm gonna, looking at the time, I'm gonna try to get through a couple of other questions that have been um, uh, submitted. Mark Root Wiley asks, uh, specifically for Amy, but I think everybody can probably comment on this. Um, what are use cases for post types and post meta that remain after your embrace of the block editor? Are you using blocks to set and display post meta? Absolutely, absolutely we are. Um, again, there is still a place for custom post types and a great thing about a lot of those um, is that they can that information can be pulled into blocks. Uh, sometimes it requires custom blocks, but once again, once you have that tool, you can really use it. So um, the the most recent one that comes to mind is we were working with a client uh, outside of higher ed, but has products, and so we can create a custom post type and have taxonomies, have um, fields, have different things for that post type that can then be pulled into a product block that people can put on their pages, you know, in the appropriate area. And so, you know, this within a higher ed, you think about all the different types of kind of structured content that you have, whether it's a course, whether it's um, a program of a major or something like that, you know, you can really, you can really leverage that structured content through the post types, through the taxonomies, through all that meta, along with the block editor to make editors experiences a lot easier and to reduce a lot of the redundant or outdated content. So all that rot that happens on websites that don't get maintained by pulling in some of that post meta through blocks, you're basically creating some dynamic content that maybe wouldn't have been dynamic before. Yeah. Uh the most common example we use on our client sites are people directories, but it, any, any type of uh, content where you're treating the post like a database entry, it's still that's still the best way to do it because it essentially is a database entry <laughs> and it has its fields that are associated with it. And so when you want to filter by something or or um, display a, a list of something where you display content pulled from inside it, that's just not feasible with the block editor. So you may want to incorporate the block editor in some way for the front end view of that post, uh, but then again, maybe not. But you certainly need a non block editor way of attaching information to that post. I like that everybody nodded their heads with uh, people directory and probably everybody watching as well. This is the, the rite of passage of higher ed is building people directories. Travis, it looked like you were going to say something. Yeah, that's that's still our most common uh, custom post type that we're building out is still people directories. And you know, you can use you know a lot of these custom post types in conjunction with block editor. You can use blocks on the custom post types, you know, and so it's you know, it's choosing the right tool for the job that you have. You know, it you can't just say, okay, well, this is just block editor, this is just custom post types. It's picking the right tool for the job that you have so that you're your clients happy and that you're doing it in a way that you're going to build support in the future. Uh, looking down the list of questions, um, and I think this 
fits very nicely into the conversation we've just been having. Um, what's from Jared, what's the biggest advantage other than layout flexibility in the editor of the block editor over structured content like post types and custom fields? So if you're if you're trying to convince somebody, I guess use the block editor instead of a more rigid template or a you know traditional maybe ACF powered theme, what do you try to sell them on? I'm going to go back to what I said before of it gives them a structure, but it also gives them some flexibility. Um, and a lot of that comes down to the training because there's only so much governance you can put into blocks. Um, you can do lots with settings and things like that. Uh, and, and we do a lot of that, but especially in higher ed, that's, that's, I feel like that's what people always wanted. People always wanted to be able to have a little bit of flexibility, at least a little bit. Normally they want a ton of flexibility, but they're willing to compromise for a little bit of flexibility to be able to say why they are unique. Um, because every program I've ever worked with, I've worked in Central Com, I've worked in colleges, both arts and sciences and all, they're all the same. They're all the same. They all think they're very special and they are very special. Don't get me wrong, you're very special. Um, but we're all solving the same challenges. And so the block editor really allows to solve the big challenges, but provide the flexibility that individuals need. That's a very nice. Yeah, that's, Wait, oh, Travis, go uh, ahead. Oh, it's fine. Um, so yeah, one thing that I try to sell people on is there's, it's very flexible. You know, I can build out custom blocks to eliminate the need for having to use a third party solution so that we are using something that we manage, we know how it's going to change, when it's going to change, and we don't have to try to plan for when, you know, like a third party is going to change something or, you know, even if a third party decides, you know what, we're, we're done with this plugin. So, you know, then you're using something that's not supported and that's not ideal either. So, you know, for example, one, one solution, you know, one thing that we needed at Mizzou was a way to use accordions. You know, there are probably thousands of accordion plugins out there, you know, and you'd have to kind of tweak them a little bit to use the styling that Mizzou uses, or we could create a custom block that already uses a React component that we've built. And so, Using that, we manage it, we know how it's going to change, we know when it's going to change, and we can set restrictions on how we want folks to use it. And so I think that's the most exciting thing is, you know, we can sell it as, you know, we are, we're using this, we're embracing this. And, you know, if you use this on your site, you can take advantage of some of our Mizzou branded components, and you can see it in the editor. It's, it's nice, you're not having to do kind of you know, add something into a, an ACF field and then, you know, click preview to see kind of how it's going to look when it's the information's pushed over into a template. You can actually see it on the edit screen. It may not always be one to one, but it's going to get you at least in the ballpark. So you can, you can have that mental picture of how it's going to look whenever you publish the page. And I actually just had this experience last week of um, right now we're uh, we have one site that's stuck in the classic editor that we're trying to upgrade and I needed to insert tables. And I was like, oh crap, I've completely forgotten how to hard code tables in the classic editor. Whereas in Gutenberg, pull in that table block, do all my settings in there and it's so much easier. So that may be outside the flexibility. There's also, once you get up to speed with it, there's a speed to be able, able to add things. The thing that threw me about the question was the other than layout flexibility in the editor part, because uh, honestly, that's enough. <laughs> it's a really, really good advantage. Uh, and if you've ever tried to build um, a site using custom fields where people could insert say a floating aside into a block of text that used to be very complicated. And I came up with multiple solutions over the years, some involving short codes. Uh, and it's not easy for the users to visualize how it's going to work. And that's almost trivial with Gutenberg. Uh, it's that the ability to put things together <laughs> that, that with custom fields tend to be isolated 
So a lot of our designs would just be rows of stuff. And if you wanted to take something out of this kind of row and put it into this kind of row, that was just not going to happen <laughs> unless we had a huge budget. <laughs> so yeah, layout flexibility is, is maybe a bigger deal than, than some people think it might be. All right, so we are about a minute over time for our 45 minutes, um, but I do want to just close on one nice sort of ending question, which is a uh, thing about higher ed specifically, but also just WordPress world in general. Um, what do institutions and the companies that support them need to be thinking about for the next five years of WordPress? Um, with all of everything that has happened and where we're heading next. And I guess try to keep your answer to 15 seconds or less. <laughs> so uh, I'll start with uh, Travis again. Lovely. It's a, it's a softball question. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think it's just, you know, use the tool that's going to work best for you. Sometimes it's going to be WordPress. Sometimes it might be something else. And you, know, you just got to use whatever the best tool is for the job. Amy? Um, I'm going to say iteration, be ready and don't be scared of iterating. It, it may be fine right now. It may not be fine later and that's okay. We can always make continuous improvements. And I think as we have seen with Gutenberg and the block editor, that's, that's just a core function of it. And Jesse, I would say always be on the lookout for problems that have already been solved because rolling your own solution in this environment uh, is will often get you stuck. <laughs> and if you can stick with pre-existing solutions, especially if they're provided by WordPress that you might've missed if you didn't really look, uh, you're going to have a more future-proof site. Those are all great answers. And I'll use these last 15 seconds to get on my soapbox and say, uh, institutions should hire more web developers and pay them more and send them to trainings. Um, so with that, uh, thank you all very much for um, answering my terrible questions and sharing your fantastic thoughts. Um, thank you to everybody who uh, was watching and participating in the Q&A. Um, I think everybody can be reached in the attendees channel. And I also want to plug the Guten channel in the WP Campus Slack, which is year-round all things Gutenberg. Um, so thank you all very much. <laughs>